Hi everyone, today we are going to again model a function with an MLP, but today we want to upgrade our optimization step and use the torch atom optimizer instead of our simple optimizer that we used in past videos. And to demonstrate this, we want to try modeling a more complex function. So we're going to model this function shown right here. And what's interesting is that this denominator is going to evaluate to zero when we evaluate this over the range of negative one to one. So it's going to create some singularities in our data. So we're going to pick up from the notebook that we left off a um, in previous videos and just start there um, to get started. So let's get coding. Okay, so I've defined two functions, one for my numerator and one for my denominator. And just to show you why we're going to get singularities, let's talk about the denominator. So when I plot just the denominator as a function of x, anywhere that it evaluates to zero is where we're going to have a singularity, because ultimately our function is going to be like this. So our function is just going to be the numerator divided by the denominator. So anytime we divide by zero, normally that's going to create interesting uh, problems because we can't actually divide by zero. So if I look at this function, which again is just the denominator, I can see a negative 1, negative 0 0.5, 0, 0 0.5, somewhere around 0 0.9 and one are all locations where it's going to evaluate the zero. If I take a look at my function, uh, we can figure out why this is the case. So first I can make this go to zero by giving this a negative 0 0.2. That'd be about right here. And, and indeed, that's where this evaluates to zero. Also at 0 0.9. Then this function sine goes from zero to two pi to make a complete circle. That's the unit circle. So um, at different intervals, so at zero, it's going to vary to zero. And also when it's at pi, it's going to vary to zero. So in this in this range, because we've multiplied it by two pi, that means that at negative one, zero, or negative zero point five, um, zero and 0 0.5 and 1, it's all going to evaluate to 0 at those locations. So that's why this is what our function looks like. Now if we change it to see what the actual function is going to look like. Okay, so I evaluated my function. I got y test. Now I'm plotting x against y test. And you can see these singularities that I was talking about at each of the locations. And I limited the range so that as things go to positive or negative infinity, it doesn't blow up our plot. So obviously this is a little more complex than the previous than the, the previous parabola that we used. And we want to see how well our MLP can actually approximate this function. So let's continue to code and see where we get. Okay, so this is, we've made our MLP. We put our X and Y values into batches. We evaluated our MLP and we got our Y prime. We took it out of its batch format so that we can plot it. And you can see our initial, our initial um, if model obviously is bad because we haven't trained it yet. So let's see what happens when we actually begin to train our function. Okay, so you can see that we actually have no values coming out, which is kind of interesting. So what's going on? Let's take a quick look at our our values, and they're all NAND. Okay, so I had a few problems, and I'm going to talk about the solution. So the problem was when I trained this MLP, it kept on giving NAND values. There's a few things I tried to solve the problem. So first, I thought maybe it was the I was getting num 
NAND values. So I try to add the torch NAND to num. However, I'm not using the newest version of torch. Don't have that available, so I had to use the numpy equivalent. So here I added numpy NAND to num, and it converted back to a tensor. That didn't work, so then I started looking at the y values, and right at the singularities that I was talking about, the values of y were becoming unreasonably humongous. And the solution was then to just clamp the values of the of our function. So the torch clamp, I gave it a value. I said it can go from negative 100 to 100 using the clamp function here. And that solved the problem of the NAND values. So with that problem solved, let's keep moving uh, with the tutorial. So I'm going to train this now for a few more steps. 3000. Okay, you can see when I train it for more steps, you know, 3000 steps, you know, the evaluation, the ability of the MLP to model this function is bad. Let's try running this a few more times. I'm just going to rerun this cell and see if it gets better. A little bit better. Okay, so I've run it several times now. Three times, so this would be 9000 epochs. And it's not a value, it's not modeling this function super well. So let's see if we can swap out our optimizer and see if we're able to improve the result. Okay, so we finished coding up our function. I ran it for 3000 epochs like I did with our simple MLP. Except for this time I used the Atom Optimizer. And if I take a look at the results, you can see that this is still, it's not perfect, but compared to this MLP that I optimized with just a simple a simple function where it's taking the gradient times the learning rate. This is significantly better. There's a lot more nuanced and I've only run actually run for a third of the number of epochs. So let's just talk through what I actually did. So I made this new class called Stepper V2. I used the fast core library, which is going to restore my inputs right here. So all it does is take these values from here and just stores them as attributes of the uh, of this class. Then I made this function do epochs. So first I want to specify learning rate. Either I'm going to use this one if, or I want to use, be able to pass one uh, when I call this function. So I say if this learning rate is none, then use the one that we stored from earlier. Otherwise use the one that I just passed. Then when I actually make my atom optimizer itself, I have to first pass it the parameters, so it is self MLP parameters. And again, I store this MLP with this store uh, att attributes function. So I get all my parameters by calling the parameters function. Then I specify the learning rate. I make a list so I can store my loss values. Um, so if we want to plot it in a minute, we could do that. Then I'm going to zero out my gradients send my x data through my MLP, calculate the loss, call backwards, just like we did before. So for this time, instead of manually multiplying or updating the values based on the negative gradient times the learning rate, we're just going to call step. And that it's going to basically do the same thing. Now, the Atom Optimizer uses a thing called momentum in order to keep track of how fast a variable is changing when it's being optimized. 
This is why it's better, and also it can adapt its learning rate uh, on the fly for each parameter, which is really helpful. So let's just take a quick look at the, the loss, actually. All right, if we take a quick look at the loss, you can see it's going down. Looks like there's still a lot of room for improvement, but the fact that it's going down is good. Looks like if we train it for more epochs, which we can do right now, it'll probably continue to get better. All right, so we ran it for 3,000 more epochs. This is getting more nuanced. You can see it's still struggling with the singularity, but over here it's doing reasonably well. Our error has actually gone down another, the loss value has gone down another 100, which is impressive. So that's showing the, our simple um, optimizer that we've used in the past versus using the Atom optimizer. Maybe to finish it off, let's just plot the two results right next to each other. And because we ran our MLP for our, our first MLP, just with the simple optimization that I had set up before for a 9,000 by running running the cell three times. Let's also run this three times and then see what we get. Okay, so I knew there was something wrong. I was plotting the wrong value, that's why. So now after running all my cells again, you can see that the simple grid descent algorithm is doing pretty poorly, whereas the atom optimizer is able to better model this complex function, which is pretty interesting. So that's telling us that the ability of a, of a neural network to correctly optimize something is dependent not only on its actual like how we structure it, but also how we go about optimizing its weights. So the optimization algorithm we choose is actually going to play an important role in making sure our functions um, are, are best approximating what we actually want them to do. That's all for today. Thanks for watching.